Hi guys, uh, let's start. So uh, I'm Tomek, I'm a software engineering manager at a Swedish company called Secure, and at the same time DevOps lead at a company called Lea. Uh, I'm, uh, most of my time I'm a backend guy. Uh, for the last two years I'm involved in mobile development. I'm not a mobile expert. Uh, guys in our teams are mobile experts, and uh, thanks to them I'm able to, to say, to tell you something about DevOps, which usually, or in the conferences is associated with backend technologies. And I made an effort to compare, okay, what practices are viable in the mobile context, which aren't, and there are some things I don't have answers to. Maybe you will have, uh, let's see during my talk. Um, first thing when you need to compare mobile context with, with backend context is that people don't uh, download updates or they don't do it, or some, some of them do, some of them don't, it depends. Which means that usually rollbacks are not possible as a way of dealing with problems on production. Moreover, uh, unlike on servers, on backend technologies, it's not possible to, to have such a good visibility of what's happening on production, and app instrumentation is also different. And third thing is that the fragmentation of devices, especially on Android, uh, and their uh, proliferation, so becoming just out of date, uh, is pretty, pretty high. And also, uh, frequency, when, frequency of uh, operating system updates is, is way bigger than on backend technologies. Um, and this puts some special context in terms of DevOps. And I will not explain initially what DevOps is, I will start with examples, and eventually I will reach the definition of DevOps and how it differs in mobile context and, and backend context. So let's start. Um, Facebook, 2007, they wanted to introduce Facebook chat, which today is known as Messenger. Uh, it was purely on web. And the most consuming uh, operation when implementing chat is not the chat itself, but ability to say that someone is idle or active. Because the website, or in this case a page, needs to query all the time if your friend is active now or not. So what they did, instead of initially implementing all that stuff and then putting it on production, even though they didn't have the backend, uh, the backend technology, what they did, they already implemented the JavaScript client, which was pretending to query the backend system about who is available or not. And they put it immediately, even when the backend was not ready. It was hidden by CSS. And throughout the year of development, they were testing on production with real users uh, the traffic and the load, which was induced by, by chat functionality. When they said that they are done, they only changed one CSS class, and suddenly uh, the chat was visible for 70 million of users without any downtime, without any problems. And this is a DevOps approach. And uh, the problem is that when you need to verify on real users, maybe instead of making extensive tests, maybe you should separate the deployments from releases. Some people don't understand what's a deployment, what's a release, so maybe I'll explain it. Deployment, it is an installation environment. This is the engineering team which is responsible for fast and reliable deployments, uh, or sorry, uh, installations on production environment. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the functionality is available for, for end customers. And this is what releases are. Releases, this is the uh, functionality available for customers. And this is the product owner or project manager who is responsible for, uh, for, the, for the business success. And that's the major difference. And there are several ways how you can achieve that. First one is dark launch, which is what Facebook did. So uh, having a hidden functionality, if you, in, in 2007, if you had like Firebug, if you launch it, you would see requests being sent as if there was chat messages and querying for active users or not. That's one technique, which can be used in mobile context, because it's, no, it's, no pro, it's not a problem to uh, deploy an app or release an app which does something hidden for the end user, but verifying, uh, I don't know, for instance, load or performance. The other thing was feature toggle, which for instance we use, and uh, this is a setting screen from our app. This is what normal users see, but we are integrating with Masterpass, that's uh, uh, e-payment technology by MasterCard, and only some people see uh, MasterPass a configuration they're able to pay with MasterPass. And those people are our employees and trusted users, 
but uh, we don't have any other option than tested in production. And feature toggle, it's implemented in a way that in our backend, we have a configuration which we can change. We can say, okay, this user should have master pass turned on. Or this country, this market should have master pass turned on. While other users, even though they have the app with master pass functionality, they cannot use it. And this is, a, this is an approach which is a typical DevOps approach which can be used in mobile context. Let's move on. Uh, let's assume we are, we are a company which builds houses. And to build a house, you need to have the, the, the cube of a house, then you need to put a roof on top, then you need to put a chimney. And you work for one customer, then you work for the blue customer, then you work for the green customer. But usually the, re the reality looks like this, that you work, start working for one customer, and then another project manager or product owner comes to your team and says, okay, we need to work for other customers as well. So we switch our work, right? Then there's another product owner who wants to stuff to be worked for him or her, right? So we start working, we say, okay, maybe we should focus on building blocks, then on building, uh, then on building uh, roofs or rooftops, and then on chimneys. And the second solution seems to be quite good because everyone is happy because we are working on every project in parallel, right? Every product owner or project manager is happy because we are working on their stuff. But let's think about productivity measured here. Uh, I would say it's the same. We produced three houses at the same time, right? But what about time to market? What about the red customer? Apparently, the red customer, instead of getting his house here, he got his house here. The blue customer, she got his house, instead of having his house produced here, she gets it here. Only the green customer doesn't see the difference. But I'm on purpose ignoring one crucial factor, especially which applies to people, which is context switching. Context switching works like this, but it takes time to, to context switch. So to switch your focus and attention to work on different stuff. So in the first case, most probably the work looks like this. Whereas in the second case, it gets pretty nasty. And it's really hard to observe that in IT because we are dealing with abstract things, not like in a factory where we can see stuff. And uh, this is a way of working. You don't need to be a faster developer or a faster admin or a faster QA engineer to produce more stuff in the same unit of time. Maybe it's a matter of organizing your work. And uh, then suddenly the productivity and time to market are pretty important. And the problem which DevOps tries to solve in this case is that there is lots of mentality from the early 20th century factories that all the people should be utilized. So people are treated like resources. If you are, don't have nothing to do now, it is a waste, which is not true. Because maybe we should focus more on flow and understand that context switching is a cost. And maybe even though at the given certain point of time we don't have nothing to do or a given person doesn't have, a, doesn't have uh, tasks to do, which is usually wrong, uh, but still we should be focused on one, on one project. <clears throat> There's always room for refactoring. There's always room for testing, for instance. And um, this focus on flow optimization is something which DevOps talks about. And in mobile context, same rules apply and it's nothing different. Next example. Let's assume you need to send a letter. So you need to print it, you need to fold it in free, you need to put it into an envelope, and then you need to send it, right? What happens if you need to do 1,000 of such operations? So send 1,000 letters. Would you do it in a batch? If yes, then in what should be the size of a batch? Uh, should you like do it 100 times or a pack of 100 letters and send it, or maybe 500 or, or 1,000. Does anyone have a clue how you should solve this? What's faster? Should I do it like in 500, 500 letters at a time? OK, no idea. So apparently, um, it's been said that people working with smaller batches uh, are faster which usually is counterintuitive because if you have letters and then you need to, and then you need to, maybe it's better just to print 100 of them or 1,000 of them than fold it 1,000 times, then put it in the envelope 100 times and send it. Apparently, if you don't take into consideration quality, maybe it's okay. But in an experiment with people, 
it appeared, for instance, that if you do it 1,000 times and fold it 1,000 times and then try to put it into an envelope, maybe you will learn that you are folding it in the wrong way. And suddenly you need to refold 1,000 letters, which is a great waste. And uh, if people can do errors with such simple tasks like folding letters, then what about IT when we don't see that immediately that we are doing something wrong because we get a feedback eventually late in the delivery process. And this is the case which DevOps tells also about, which is working large batches. And the solution to that is working in small batches. <laughs> so uh, maybe instead of working on five features simultaneously, maybe the whole team should focus on one feature, put it onto production, and see what they learned, and readjust the process when working on the second feature, third, and so on. And in mobile context, it doesn't make a difference because there is no difference for the backend features or mobile features in terms of that, that particular criteria. So let's move now to some um, more concrete example. This is a Spotify desktop player or desktop client. Uh, it's a desktop app. And actually, it's a one big web browser uh, which presents separate web applications in iframes. So these are the web applications separately deployed, separate teams working on them. So if someone needs to update a player in your Spotify client, one team deploys a web application, there is no need to deploy the whole app, right? And this cuts down dependencies inside the monolithic application. And because there are separate teams organized around certain web applications, they can work independently. So you reduce the complexity uh, of the whole monolithic application, but change or move the complexity to the interaction between components. Uh, one of the challenges they need to face, because these are iframes, they need to rewrite the browser so that when you press the right button and there is a context menu presented, it doesn't get cut at the edge of the iframe, but it gets visible or spans over the other iframe. That's one of the technical challenges Spotify had to do. And this is another DevOps approach, um, which tries to solve a problem of heavy architectures, which doesn't make it easy for fast and frequent deployments. And the solution to that is trying to do architectures which support low-risk deployments, and how it can be applied in mobile context. What we try to do uh, is that, that's a screenshot from our app, uh, you can see a list of uh, receipts so what, what, me personally, what I was buying. And this is a native view. But then if you enter one of the receipts, you will see that this is a, maybe customer maybe won't see it, but we know it. This is a, this is a web view, right? And uh, this was, back in the days, our response to cutting dependencies between mobile team and backend team, which seemed at the time to be fine, because we could change the view of receipts uh, independently of app releases. But eventually we think it's wrong because of UX stuff. Uh, if you, I mean, it's our experience. If you rely too much on, uh, too much on uh, web views, suddenly when you need to access some native features of your phone, the mobile team needs to prepare some special JavaScript libraries which are injected for, to a web view, which gives access to, uh, to native features of a phone. And, uh, and the UX experience, as I said, is way, way, way worse for us, at least, than if you can do it in a native, in a native, uh, in a native uh, equivalent. But there is another approach uh, being more popular at the moment and proposed by one of the engineers in our team. Uh, it's an Android app, our app, where people can either, uh, on the home screen, they can either send money to other users, uh, scan a QR code at the cash register and pay, or tap and pay as if they had a, a contactless card. So maybe the way to decompose our app, to cut dependencies uh, inside the app and between engineers, is to produce three different micro apps with separate functionalities. So if someone doesn't want to use scan and pay functionality, sure he won't download this app. And will only download the app responsible for contactless payments, for instance, or peer-to-peer -peer transfers. 
And the architecture for such apps usually looks like this, but there is some common layer used in every app with authentication, security, session management, and some common libraries. Usually there is some analytics because we need to monitor what we do, uh, configuration maybe, some common UI components, and then you are able to, beat, uh, to build micro apps with certain functionalities. And this kind of approach uh, really reduces risk and complexity because if I do a change in, a, I don't know, peer-to-peer -peer functionality, I release only this micro app, but there's almost no risk that I will introduce regression errors to other functionalities like tap and pay or scan and pay, which makes the development faster because there is less testing needed. This is a kind of DevOps way of thinking about, about architecture either in the backend, as I showed you with Spotify, or in mobile apps. However, there's a catch, as always. It's a trade-off. Suddenly, your organization, marketing organization, needs to uh, market three apps instead of one. And you need to build communication around as many apps as you have. So this is a trade-off. Uh, yeah, let's, let's move further on. Um, let's move to the Netflix example, back-end example. Uh, Netflix has a couple of thousand nodes in their infrastructure. And the way you start dealing with those nodes is that they look at it as a, as a group of sheep. So uh, if one sheep, an animal, uh, is ill, they just remove it from the group and put another sheep inside. And this is how they deal with, with their infrastructure. When they see that one node is misbehaving, or actually they call it an outlier, uh, they just remove it and put another node, uh, put another node uh, in the infrastructure. That's how they prevent some massive failures uh, of their service by being able to dynamically change their infrastructure. The ways to detect an outlier, uh, you can find it in the article, uh, they look at some certain, uh, certain uh, criteria. Uh, if, it's, uh, if, it's, if, if it can be modeled as a as a uniform distribution function, they just look how many standard deviations is a given, is a given result away from the, from the cluster of, of, healthy, of healthy nodes. How you can deal with this uh, in mobile context then? The problem is, of course, how we are doing on production. And the solution is proactive monitoring, which gives you a feedback loop to how you are dealing with those, uh, with those nasty nodes. In mobile context, it's way different. And I can give an example of our app which has a, a QR code scanner. And at a certain point of time, we had to, we had to, uh, we had to replace the, the QR code scanner with another implementation, with native implementation of iOS. So uh, what we did, uh, we uh, released an app with two uh, libraries for scanning QR codes. And, were, and we were able, by feature toggle, to manipulate which users which users are using the new implementation of QR scanner and which users are using the old implementation of QR scanner. And we chosen the most frequent users to use the new one. And you can see it's around a couple of percent, two and a half percent, are using the native scanner, the new one, instead of the old one. Uh, and at the same time, it's, it's taken from Google Analytics. We are measuring what's the scanning time. Apparently, the native QR scanner was better, uh, which was kind of cool. Uh, initialization time was worse, which wasn't that cool, and we had to make a decision which implementation then we should use, but we were testing with real users on production environment. The next thing we were checking was, okay, how many errors were thrown during scanning a QR code? And with the new one, the native scanner, it was around 1.1%, whereas with the old one was worse. So we said, okay, I think we have a solution. So let's uh, change the configuration of our backend so that more people are using the new QR code library. But one day we got a Crashlytics report and suddenly we saw that, okay, almost 2% of our production users faced the crash of the app. We checked the uh, crash report and actually, yeah, there was 37 crashes and some users were influenced by that. We got back to our statistics where now the majority of users were using the native one, native scanner. And actually, yeah, we see that more people are having problems when with the old one. So we implemented the fix, uh, deployed a new app, and, and yeah, and fixed the problem. 
how it could it could look differently. I mean, uh, we could test it extensively in house, but we are never able to simulate a traffic of real users uh, in our company, right? So what we started to do, we were balancing with the risk and trying to find a sweet spot uh, that, okay, we are putting something in production with a limited number of users, with heavy monitoring and making decisions how we should deal with it and being able to control it from the back end and not by releasing a new app. If we experienced a major problem with the new library, we're able to, in real time, turn it off for users so that they can they can use the old library, which, is, which was stable at the time. Okay, so that's one approach. Let's now move to the Netflix example. Uh, again, how many of you, how many of you uh, heard about Chaos Monkey? Some of you, okay. Uh, for the rest of you, this is a tool uh, open sourced by Netflix. What it does, it, uh, Netflix, most of the infrastructure of Netflix is in Amazon Cloud. So what Chaos Monkey uh, does is it randomly chooses to turn off certain machines. It may be a node uh, in a network, it may be a, I don't know, EC2 instance, it may be a database master, it may be a load balancer, you name it. What they test is how their infrastructure behaves in case of a failure and provides a feedback loop back to the, uh, uh, to the, to the development team. And uh, thanks to that, when there was a major downtime in Amazon in one of the regions, uh, Netflix was the only service which survived that. For instance, Quora, it stopped working. But the things that they, Netflix learned during a controlled failures is that they were able to write automatic scripts which recognized that something is going wrong and they were setting up new infrastructure in other regions which was healthy. This is a devil's way of thinking. And uh, what kind of problem it's, it's, it solves? It solves a problem of little knowledge or, or learning um, gets back to the team from production environment. And the solution is inject errors to production environment. Uh, CTO of Netflix said that he doesn't want to test if, if everything works good on staging. He wants to test that everything, go, everything uh, works well in production environment. And uh, I must admit that I don't know a bank which would like to, which would like to uh, on purpose, inject errors on production environment. They are waiting until it happens uh, by some external factors. Um, how to do it in mobile context? I have no idea. Uh, we are dealing with real users, real people, and I just cannot imagine a situation when your app may crash on purpose. Or maybe this is just me being limited. Uh, but this is a cultural thing and the way of thinking. Okay, next, next stuff. Whoa, sorry. Uh, next stuff. Uh, one of the companies I had a chance to work with uh, had a problem on production environment. Uh, what happened is that 23 transactions failed. Money was collected from people. But... Uh, it was presented for the, uh, f to the shop that, uh, that the transaction failed. So please imagine a situation when you pay with a card in the shop, you see that the transaction has failed, but then you move to your e-banking system and see that money is collected, right? This is this kind of situation. And the way to deal with it, of course, it happened, but it is a cultural thing how organization deals with such a situation. Does it seek for people who should be blamed for that? and punished, maybe, or, uh, or uh, maybe we should investigate what happened not to, not to find, uh, to prevent in the future from, happening, from it happening again, right? And uh, the, the tool you can see right now, it's called the post-mortem. The way to deal with this, you write, uh, you draw a timeline meet with all the people who are involved in this case, either as developers, QA engineers, sysadmins, you name it, uh, and start drawing events from the future or the most present events to the past. And uh, the team said, okay, we drew, uh, we started to implement manual fixes, so started to do manual refunds or reversals for the people 
So it was only 23 transactions, so it's not that bad. So they were able to, once they learned what happened, they were able to do it uh, within two minutes. Uh, sorry, within two hours. Uh, then a uh, patch was also uh, introduced to, to the code. Uh, it was on the given day on, at 2 p.m., right? What happened earlier? Uh, the guy who was monitoring the production at the moment, he was looking at the problem be before 8, uh, 8, 4 a.m., when nothing bad happened. But after 8, 8 uh, 4 a.m., payments stopped working. Uh, the reason for that was that one of the executor thread pools uh, reached its limits. Uh, next time, when he got back to check what's happening on production, he realized at uh, 8.18 that payments doesn't work. And that's what the guy who was monitoring the production environment realized. But at the same time, eight minutes before, the problem was fixed by someone else in the organization. So the guy who was monitoring the production said, oh, we had some problems with transactions, but now it's OK. And no one knew what happened. And during that time, some customers called the company and said, hey, you charged me with money for a transaction I didn't do. So somewhere here, they realized that maybe uh, the, the problem in the morning uh, had a more severe consequences than they initially thought. Uh, and how it all started? It started at night, uh, when there is some settlements being done uh, at night. Uh, some errors were thrown uh, and uh, written on Slack channel of that company. Uh, the process ended up with an error, and there was one guy, uh, very proactive, waking up at home. For some reason, he checked how it's going on production, and oh, there is a problem. I know this problem. I will fix it. And he fixed that till eight, uh, 4 past 8 a.m. without telling anyone about this. Because it was just, ah, OK, I'll fix it. And I'll just put it on production. Uh, it was a good behavior. But apparently, what the company realized that there was a lack of communication between people. So the guy who was monitoring the production said, oh, there was a problem, but it's, now it's OK. Hmm, let's investigate it later on. And when the team started to analyze everything what happened, they realized that earlier they had the very same problems, but with, it never ended up in such a severe consequences that people were charged uh, without a transaction being successful. Because it never escalated up to such a level. Uh, and uh, then they start writing, OK, what is the problem and what are the solutions? And one of the problems they realized that, OK, maybe we should, instead of monitoring only uh, JMS queues, we should start monitoring executor thread pools if they get full, then most probably we will experience problems with transactions. This is what the company said. There was also uh, one, of the, one of the outcomes was that one of the guys is a single point of failure. He's the only person who knows what happens on production and is able to fix that. And some solution was, uh, some solution was proposed. I had to intentionally black out every detail. It's not, to, uh, it's not possible to guess what the company is. Uh, but anyhow, the most important thing out of this story is that uh, there is enough trust in the company that you are able to speak about errors you did and find a solution. And this tool, sorry, something bad happened to my remote controller. Uh, this tool is called postmortem or blameless postmortem. And uh, the problem, and this is a DevOps thing, the problem is that very often people are afraid of speaking about their mistakes and learning from it in a company. And the way to deal with this is for leaders in a company to reinforce productive culture. The productive culture, what it is, to give an example from a different industry, uh, in hospitals, there was lots of, uh, lots of accidents happened affecting, affecting uh, patients. And the way to deal with this, apparently, according to research, is not to increase number of processes, making them more specific, 
trying to make everything algorithmic. Uh, actually, it didn't change in a positive way the uh, number of accidents which happen in hospital. What actually the, the solution to that problem was changing the culture. So changing the culture from a typical one which is uh, in some companies people are blamed and punished for errors. And if you blame and punish people for errors, most probably if something similar will happen in the future, you will never know about this before, uh, before the failure happens in production. So the key thing is try to build uh, a culture in your organization where uh, when errors happen, instead of finding the blame, the bl instead of playing the blame game, uh, we try to sit together and think about, okay, so why it happened? Let's find the root cause, not only the obvious ones that executor threat pool uh, got full, but how it all happened and where we failed. And in mobile context, it doesn't change at all because it's just dealing with failures. Um, okay. So what I did now, I present you the three basic uh, foundations of DevOps, which is taking care of the flow, so how fast things move from left to right, from an idea to production. That's dealing with flow. You can deal with it the way you work, if you work in parallel on several things, if the architecture supports low uh, risk deployments. Uh, if, if you are able to separate deployments from releases, that's dealing with flow. Uh, feedback, which is how fast information travels in the other direction. If your organization is built in a way that development team is separated from the production environment, then organization by design builds a wall where development team doesn't know outcomes of their work on the real, real environment. And the third thing, very often underestimated, is the certain culture. Those things couldn't have been invented by Netflix, Amazon, Facebook, Google, uh, and so on, if there wasn't a certain culture in their company which forgives mistakes and gives room for experimentation, taking risk, and analyzing the errors. And because this is a DevOps presentation, uh, I haven't mentioned continuous integration, continuous deployment now, so I'm gonna do it. So uh, for those who are not satisfied with the fact that I'm talking about DevOps and not t telling about continuous integration, continuous deployment, so let's see how Spotify does that with mobile apps. So uh, in Spotify, if you look at a client, it can be a, I don't know, desktop client for Mac, desktop client for Windows, iOS app, Android app. Actively, there's 30 to 50 developers working on a certain client. Uh, uh, they work on one project per client. There is usually between 80 to 120 commits per day. In a certain release, there's 1,000 commits per release. So quite a, few, quite a lot, I would say. By the way, they release every second two weeks their apps. If you look at their continuous integration process, if someone uh, makes a commit and issues a pull request, uh, Average time for pull request being reviewed by other peer, uh, peer members takes less than 10 minutes. 70% uh, of all pull requests get, uh, get uh, merged within the first four hours. And there is around 10,000 unit tests being launched, uh, being launched during, per client during integration tests and so on. And uh, how it looks, the delivery process. So uh, if the code is in develop branch, then it gets pushed, or there's a pull request, then it's fetched by continuous integration, and then it's uh, tested in a supervised way. In develop uh, phase, usually developers, they deal with unit tests, integration tests, and, and that's the automated part, and then there is the manual testing, like every developer does, I guess. Uh, during the push uh, phase, so during the uh, pre-commit phase, uh, all the tests are launched, which takes them less than 10 minutes. And this is the way how they need to arrive at this value. It's not like you are given when you have 10,000 tests. It's quite a challenge to launch them in less than 10, uh, 10 minutes. And that's the investment. Um, in the continuous integration phase, when everything, uh, when everything is being merged to, to one, 
uh, to one branch. Then those tests take less than 60 minutes. And employees and beta testers, uh, employees and beta testers uh, get the nightly builds. And this was also case in our company uh, because our product, it's not available in Poland. And eventually it was a quite an investment, even there was no business reason for that, for our app to be available in Poland, and it's not in App Store or in Google Play, but it's available for our employees. And our employees can pay with our app contactless in shops. And they, are, they became testers of the work we do together. So um, uh, it's called dog fooding, right? So we started dog fooding uh, uh, our app. And in case of Spotify, uh, the performance exploratory tests and stress tests, they happen under the supervised, uh, supervised uh, procedure and then the app is ready to deploy. And how is it organized in terms of branches? So there is a master branch. I said they release every second week. So uh, during the week one, they just do the work, they develop things, and uh, at night, the nightly builds are there, and they are pushed to employees. So employees of Spotify, they get, uh, they get nightly builds on their phones, and they can test it if they listen to music. Uh, once the week ends, so the iteration ends, the release branch is, uh, is set from the master branch, and that's the moment when only bug fixing takes place. So uh, those are the beta releases, and then the full release happens with the last valid fix. Um, what they, well, we also what we do, what Spotify does, at least in terms of our Android app, is that we uh, do staged releases. So usually on Monday, uh, we release uh, the new app to 10% of, of our customers, uh, then to 30% the following day, then to 50%, and then uh, to 100%. And before a decision is made to upgrade a number of users who are able to download the new app, we always check crash analytics to find if there are any new errors with the new app. And this is the kind of answer, uh, this is the kind of answer um, to a problem that you don't have unlimited testing powers in your company, regardless if this is because of number of people you have in a company or just a budget. Uh, but this is the way to trying to make a trade-off between, okay, uh, what's the risk if we release an app to 10% of people, especially if you have other tools like feature toggles where you can turn off the given functionality if there is a problem. Uh, and yeah, basically that's it. Uh, not all companies can afford having a dedicated uh, testing team spread around the world which is able uh, to, to, on a daily basis, verify the most up-to-date version of your app. And that's the way you, sh you can deal it, and even Spotify does that, which is kind of cool. And basically, that was it. Uh, that was my story about DevOps. Uh, my aim was to show you that this is something more than continuous integration, continuous deployment. That's why it only took me five minutes of my talk about it. And looking at flow, looking at feedback loops in your delivery process, and most importantly, setting up a special culture which makes these guys happen is the key thing about DevOps. And that's it, thanks. If you have any questions, let's, let's do it. Uh, is it possible to download uh, Java code directly from the backend and run it in mobile application? I don't know if it's possible. We are not doing this. You are talking about downloading... Uh, yeah, just like you download uh, JavaScript, for example, uh, uh -huh. an embedded... Uh, but you, you, mean, you mean a source code or a compiled no, I'm code? No, compiled code. Uh, I don't know if it's possible. We. What kind of problem would it solve? You mean the, the dy dynamic? Yeah, you don't have to, um, to upload your uh -huh. app to App Store. To, to my best knowledge, I guess it is possible. Uh, I've seen a situation in a company where uh, groovy scripts uh, were used for such a thing, where you, can, you could dynamically upload groovy scripts uh, and they were implemented, interpreted on a device and that's how you could change the behavior. It depends on the problem we are trying to solve. But yeah, it sounds like a good uh, solution to certain kind of problems. 
Uh, you mentioned in Spotify, uh, yeah. every public request get merged um, less than four hours, mm -hmm. you said. And do you know any specific techniques they use to realize it? I don't have that kind of knowledge. <laughs> Uh, I can tell you from my experience when I have a chance to observe different organizations uh, but the first thing I would look at is people if if there is a culture and team that hey guys I have a pull request waiting and it's just uh, people the other guys are okay I will will check it out because the, the key thing about pull request is the feedback loop and this is one of the shortest feedback loops you can have apart from unit tests of course one of the shortest feedbacks loop you can have uh, but as far as tools are concerned, I cannot tell you. I don't know. I know they are using Team City as their CI, uh, uh, CI environment. In Secure, we are using uh, Bamboo and Stash, and pull requests uh, are done before the actual merge to the main branch. And it depends when, in our, at least in our case, it depends when they are uh, when they are released. But at least me, I pay great attention to, uh, to things not waiting too long in the in review column on our Kanban board. Uh, because the task is not ended if it's not reviewed by at least two people. And surprisingly, this kind of culture, at least in our company, regardless if it's a backend team or, or app team, uh, is, is, is there. But from team to team, it depends. Some teams can wait two days, some teams do it instantly. But I, I uh, at least in our company, the way we try to do it is that we try to help people realize that it's for their sake or for their, uh, it's better for them if they do code reviews more early and not try to force that. At least we are not that kind of company where we force people to do code reviews. We try to help them realize that it's better for them to make as frequently as possible. Cool, thank you. So uh, um, I got one question. Okay, <laughs> if I can. shoot. Um, I think not every single team can afford to have the dedicated rule like devil pruning. So basically, mm -hmm. it's in my in my in my team. Basically, we don't have an, 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 anyone like that. So developers basically do this job. Do you see like um, straight line when we actually should really think about hiring a person, devil person, dedicated to this kind of stuff, and how to convince business people to really? Mm -hmm. pay for the person yeah that's a, it's a tough question because it depends on the organization uh, the question first the first question I would ask should business people influence we are the experts in engineering so if we say that we need six people in the team it's up to us who that six people will be I know there is this um, factory like uh, factory like kind of thinking that uh, the more developers there are the more work is being done I personally disagree with that. It's about a team which is able to do the work. And then as far as the if, if uh, DevOps engineer, I guess by saying a DevOps engineer, you mean a person, uh, sysadmin who is able to develop, right? Or to automate. I don't know, actually, it depends. I've seen teams uh, with skills, uh, uh, I mean, with no DevOps engineer per se, uh, who are able to take care of continuous integration, continuous deployment. Uh, in case of our company, we have, uh, we used to have three backend teams. One team didn't have a uh, dedicated sysadmin in their team and they were still doing fine. But this is a matter just of constraints you have in an organization. Um, and that's it. Um, I, did I answer your question or I just started going around no, but not fine. hitting you this. You answer my but, but, but anyhow, um, in one sentence, I would say it depends. And uh, uh, de oh, I have a story, sorry. Uh, we have one minute. We have one minute. Uh, one of the patterns which emerges in big organizations is uh, building a platform team. There are, there's a platform team or teams and there are services teams around that. The responsibility of platform team is to build, uh, depends, software as a service, platform, platform as a service, depends on the architecture. But their responsibility is to deliver a system for service teams, services teams, which are on top of that, for them to make it easier to develop. 
So those kind of platform teams, they create tools and they create infrastructure so that it's easy for the services team just to build functionalities on top. So there's a responsibility of platform teams towards uh, the services teams and then services teams, uh, their responsibility is to do delivering functionality to end customers. And then the question is, if you have such a setup, and this is a setup in Amazon, for instance, in Netflix as well, uh, then maybe in services team there is no need for sysadmin or DevOps engineer, but maybe those DevOps engineers, they should be in a platform team. That's how it goes in big organization. This is a pattern which I see emerges in those kind of big companies. Also Spotify, I guess. Cool. More questions? Um, we don't have time for more questions, so thank you very much.